Hi, I'm Dave. You know, a few years ago, I did a video in one of the agencies that I used to work for. It was very negative. Um, it was all correct and true, honest. I'm willing to go to court and testify on that, but I decided to do one that's more just based on the casework that I did and try to keep my negative opinions and uh, viewpoints on some of the things that, that were bad out of this. More of a history and because uh, the job I had, at least in the beginning, doesn't exist anymore. And it was a very unique position for several years. And so part of the history of the agency, whether they want to remember that or not, it was something very unique that no other agency had ever tried and probably will never do again. So in 2001, so at that time I already had 10 years in, with Department of Interior, working law enforcement for U.S. Fish and Wildlife for National Wildlife Refuges, National Park Ranger doing law enforcement on National Park Units, and a Bureau of Land Management law enforcement ranger protecting public lands. And the last job with BLM, the Bureau of Land Management, was in Northern California. And I saw an opening for special agent with NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, uh, National Marine Fisheries Service, um, Office of Law Enforcement, Department of Commerce. So I put in for it, uh, 1811 Special Agent position. Went to Long Beach, did interviews, I took some tests. Um, and then when I was, uh, right after 9-11, I got accepted for the job. And so I went through the uh, Federal Law Enforcement Training Center. For close to two years, I went through a lot of nonstop training criminal investigator school, then I went through um, the marine enforcement training at FLETC down in Glencoe, Georgia, and then net basic was the basic for, for uh, NOAA. But I was put into a division, um, an Endangered Species Act Habitat Enforcement Division for salmon and steelhead. Very unique, had never been done in in NOAA before not. I mean, other agents had worked some ESA cases for salmon and steelhead, but this was the first time a division was created for that that would do nothing else but that. And in my case, it would eventually include sturgeon as well. So what had occurred was uh, NOAA's got a biological side, Protected Resource Division, and then Habitat Conservation Division, HCD, and PRD. They had publicly, while well, um, in a meeting, had stated, when someone asked, you know, why are salmon and steelhead going extinct? What are you doing? It doesn't appear that you're doing enough. And they said, it's because law enforcement's not enforcing the law. And so the SAC, you know, Special Agent in Charge, in Long Beach said, you know what, you just threw us under the bus publicly. Guess what, we're going to create a division that only investigates and enforces Endangered Species Act rules and regulations. And you're going to assist us. Because if you choose not to, then we get to go public and say, we were willing to work with our biological side, but they don't want our help. So, this little tit for tat, we became a division within the law enforcement division. They brought down a former SAC to become an assistant special agent in charge. And um, there were five of us. Let me just count again. Me, yeah, five agents, 1811 special agents. And our focus would be under this division, primarily habitat cases. So they didn't really want us checking fishing licenses, but they wanted us to be out there doing these habitat cases. And then once our division got up and going, then we went through a lot of training on what they called, um, and I'm trying to think of the, the specific term, to get compliance with the law without non-traditional law enforcement is the term that they used.
Come on out. Let's go. It's my cat, Lucky. Can we say hello? Oh, you're getting too big. This is Lucky Cat. She doesn't like being held right now. All right, go. So, they create this division. We go through this training on non-traditional law enforcement where we learn how to get compliance with the law without actually getting prosecutions. And one of the things to understand is what was hard was habitat violations mostly are coming from people who are not, don't have any criminal intent to kill Sam. We're not talking about poachers. We're talking about our focus was on loggers, timber companies, farmers, uh, gravel mining companies, businesses that are out there in the environment, but their practices sometimes cause habitat uh, degradation. And so this is where it was complicated for a special agent. You're taught mostly to do criminal investigations, and here we're doing, we're giving people really warnings. That was our main priority. But that was the main priority, but at the same time, if we had a good case against someone that really was an outrageous violator, um, then we would go after them. So one of my early cases was a very good case, and it got prosecuted, but it didn't fit what kind of the type of case the agency, our division, you know, chief really wanted. But it was still a good case. Um, I get a call from a game warden, California Department of Fish and Game, which is now called California Department of Fish and Wildlife. And they said, hey, Dave, you're the new agent doing salmon stuff. Hey, we just got a call. Somebody's doing construction work in a stream. I'm heading out there. I said, okay, yeah, I want to see it. I want to go out there too. Lindsay Creek, a, tributa a tributary to the Mad River in Humboldt County. On the way, I stopped and meet with the biologist, which this would become kind of a problem. Telling management, the biological side, I need a biologist now. Well, we need to talk whether this is in a good use of their time. I said, no, I need them right now. I got a crime going on. They're coming with me. That one right there, is he available? Well, yeah, he can, but he's got some paperwork. I need him now, right now. I gotta have him now, okay? Give me one hour, give me, give me one hour, two hours at the most but I need them now. I'm, I'm literally, there's a crime in progress. I need them. It's a habitat case. And she was like, well, well, okay. And the biologist came with me. I said, this is what we've got. So I drive up, I meet with the game warden. So what had happened was in California, which is for such a liberal environmental state, people can tap into streams for their water supplies for their homes. If you've got property in a stream that runs through your property, you can stick a pipe and use it for dish cleaning, showers, you know, washing machine, anything else. So this guy had a very nice home, and here's a salmon and steelhead stream, and he's digging a ditch up to his home where he's going to put in um, a pump that will get subsurface flow eventually, and then he'll cover the ditch back up. But it was connected to the stream and he didn't put a screen up of some kind. So water was flushing into this thing while the back goes going in there. So I'm right there seeing as a federal agent, this is where I kick in on my criminal investigations. Okay, back in stream. Game warden, I say, hey, does he have a permit? No, he doesn't have a stream bed alteration agreement, a 1600 permit. So he's in violation of state law. Hey, shut it down. Got to shut it down. And then I have the biologist with me with little fishnets. I said, let's start looking in this ditch. And we find three live coho juveniles that are this big, little little smolts. Um, so what we do is we 
take pictures, document, size, everything. He confirms it. We release them back into the main channel. We force him to, to block off so no more water's flowing in. And then we start doing a thorough check with nets, big like seine nets to go through, make sure there's no other fish in there. Uh, so the landowner, he didn't get the 1600 permit. So he was charged along with the backo operator who knew when during interviews that, yeah, before you dig into streams, you got to get a permit. We didn't feel like doing it because it would take too long. So, all right, going in. This case was a civil case, um, Section 9 of the Endangered Species Act. Um, it was a take. He, even though the fish didn't die, they got trapped in the channel, which probably would have resulted in death if he had kept going in with the backhoe. He may have killed others, and that was included in the take statement. The biologist for Section 9 take has to write a um, take statement, like a biological report stating why this was a violation, not just the little ones that we found, but maybe there were others. And then we surveyed up and down above the site and below the site on the main stem of Lindsay Creek, found other fish in the area. So he was able to say three definitely got caught. We identified them. And then based on the numbers in the stream, he said, it's believed that another four or five were probably killed in the process of the backo digging it based on his expert opinion. So this was a good case, but it was relatively simple. We found live fish and transplanted them. We could, we were there when it was occurring. It was like a $6,000 civil penalty, uh, notice of violation. Uh, they didn't contest it. And, you know, for most special agents, whether you're uh, a NOAA agent or a U.S. Fish and Wildlife agent that has their own endangered species, making a Section 9 take case, especially with habitat, it's very rare. You're lucky if you make one case in your career. It just, the stars were aligned. But at the same time, again, some of the higher-ups were like, yeah, good case, but it's not the big one that we want. After that one, I started looking into something that really upset a lot of people in the agency. So there's a place right now in Humboldt County called the Headwaters, it's Bureau of Land Management, Headwaters um, National Forest Preserve. And it was the last um, standing old growth redwood grove in commercial um, hands in the late 1990s. So when I was a BLM ranger, this was the very intense time in Northern California, the timber wars. Protesters living in trees, Julia uh, Butterfly going after the Pacific Lumber Company, Scotia, uh, Scotia Pacific. Both of these were, uh, it had been a family run business, but then there was a hostile takeover. And uh, I believe uh, Mr. Hurwitz, Charles Hurwitz, was the owner, very powerful, politically connected man with both Republicans and Democrats. And so what happened was, I'm kind of going off track, but you got to understand the history of Palco, the Pacific Lumber Company, is that they have this 8,000 acre piece of property and the government desperately wants it during the Clinton years, Bruce Babbitt and Clinton. So they made a deal with the devil, basically. He said, we'll buy this for almost a billion dollars. It's $800,000. Or eight, no, not 800,000. It was, it was like $800 million. It was some outrageous number. But it was out of the 7,000, 8,000 acres, 3,000 was original old growth timber. So they wanted to protect that old growth redwoods. Home to marble murelets and ESA species and spotted owls, and of course the watersheds there had coho, chinook, and steelhead listed as threatened under the Endangered Species Act. So they buy this land, 
And part of the condition of this gigantic purchase was that Palco would get a Habitat Conservation Plan, an HCP. And this HCP, Habitat Conservation Plan, is a federal 50-year permit that allows unlimited take of endangered species on the condition that they follow best management practices. And this was a mixture of federal, multiple federal and state joint permit. And so NOAA's N was the aquatic HCP. So U.S. Fish and Wildlife had avian and terrestrial bugs, reptiles, lizards, amphibians, um, birds like the spotted owl and the marble murrelet. Um, so they had those critters, but we had the salmon. So the agency wanted to sell this HCP off as being wonderful. And if you watch my video on failures of the Endangered Species Act, you'll see I talk a lot about HCPs. 50-year permit to one of the worst timber companies when it came to obeying environmental laws. They were notorious. In the beginning, when they were family-owned, they were well-respected. Okay, but when they during the hostile takeover, when the new company took it over, then they were just liquidating it. They were just going to clear cut everything they could, and then run, get the money you can. And you, you're talking about 300,000 acres and and redwoods, you know, uh, going for I don't know at that time, sixty, seventy thousand dollars a tree, maybe more. This was very political, and it was on my radar. It's like, wait a second, why are all these protesters protesting this timber company? I'm not anti-timber. I mean, loggers work hard, and they, you know, for a long time up here, the logging timber industry, this was the working middle class, made good money working in the mills, cut trees down. So I got nothing against people that do that for a living. But this timber company had a bad reputation. It was like, why? And I started digging into it a little bit. And then one day I get a call from a game warden. Now, at that time, they had game wardens in the California Department of Fish and Game that worked primarily aquatic resource cases. They were called 1600 wardens, which is the stream bed alteration agreement. It's a state violation. And this warden... Um, won't mention his whole name, Jim, super intelligent, super intelligent guy, very helpful. Um, Jim was really like a biologist that had gotten his, his training in law enforcement. But he called me up, he goes, I hear you're brand new. He goes, here's the deal. I've got this really good case against the Pacific Lumber Company and Senator Feinstein, um, Democrat, California, is interfering with the case and the state's getting scared and my case has been shut down they're like no more you gotta knock it off he goes i thought i'd come to you and see what you you would think and i said let's do it take me out there show me what's going on i'm going to bring in i'll see if i can bring in another federal agent i'll bring in several biologists and we're going to just document what you're seeing and um we'll go from there i'm excited and it was a good case, a very good case. I think the only type of case, Section 11 of the Endangered Species Act, so it was a Section 11 case, the only one that's ever been made. And you can find that out by doing the Freedom of Information Act through Fish and Wildlife and NOAA, but it, I think this was the only one that's ever been successfully prosecuted. And uh, you'll never see another one like this ever be made again. Um, the politics were so strong on this one. And so what happened was we go out there and document um, crossings on this timber company, 300,000 acres. That's the size of, of a decent sized national park. You know, we're talking about a lot of land, 300,000 acres. And so all these windy logging roads, when they put bridges and culverts under the bridges, the culverts had to be aligned to the the 
flow of the stream, the channel of the stream. And so in many cases, in haste and not doing um, due diligence, the timber company would put them in sideways. So it was flushing this powerful thing of water, especially in the wintertime, into the banks, causing erosion, like an eddy, and causing a lot of silt and mud to get into the, the stream, which then coats um, eggs from the reds of salmon and steelhead. It's like a silk blanket that just floats on top of silt, smothers them, and they don't get the oxygen they need. So you want to try to stop erosion as much as possible. And there was actually a book that I got that was, you know, the handbook on logging roads and ranch roads. And this was the standard that was used for the HCP on how roads would be built. So this is where it's getting kind of complicated as a, as a NOAA agent. Instead of learning about ground fish and fishing gear on boats, I'm learning to understand hydraulics and road building, culvert placements, and water bars. Because all this goes back into... Um, dealing with putting silt, dirt, mud um, into the stream, which is not only does it clog the gills of adults and, and smolts, juveniles, but it's it's laying this like a blanket of mud on top of the eggs, the red. We found culverts, where a culvert. You have roads going up these, it's very mountainous here, and so very steep roads. And what would you, they need to do is put water bars so many feet. Water bars were like speed bumps. So the water rain coming down hits them, hits the water bar, flows down. And then you have, you were supposed to have full pipes that would go, you know, maybe 50 yards. And what they did is they put sometimes just half rounds. They didn't put full water bars or they didn't put any um, any pipes at all, these, these culverts. A half round is just like this, where a full culvert goes like this. Sometimes they didn't even do that, and water would flow and dig, and then you'd have landslides that's uh, sloughing with a whole side of a mountain, which is... The, the soils here in Northern California, it's just, we get so much rain in some areas up to, I mean, I think it's up to like over 150 inches of rain, maybe 200 in some areas of Humboldt County. It's like a rainforest in the wintertime with hanging moss and and um, it's just, it's amazing. But because of all these practices by the timber companies through decades is that there's a lot of landslides. And so I had to prove that the landslides that were occurring were because of the poor maintenance and the non-compliance with the HCP on road construction. And so I was able to do that and working jointly with the state game warden, going to NOAA's civil attorneys, the general counsel, at first they didn't really want to touch it, but then there was an amazing district attorney, um, Paul, last name H, um, a great guy. I haven't talked to him in many years, but he called the no attorney. He said, this is bad. We have to set a precedence with this timber company. You have, and he goes, I'm going after him for unfair business practices because they have this special um, incidental take that you gave them, but they're not following. So they're getting to kill endangered species but they're not following your permit. So that's an unfair advantage over other timber companies that don't have HCPs. And he was able to talk the NOAA attorney into, okay, let's do a joint case. And the case was an $80,000 uh, joint case, civil criminal case. No, actually civil, it was a civil case. Unfair business practice, I believe is a civil violation. And then NOAA's end of it. So it was sort of like NOAA, did $30,000 in fines and 50,000 went to the state. And um, really, again, that was for being a new special agent, that's a damn good case. And again, the only one that's ever been done 
and I can guarantee you it'll never be done again because the agency just doesn't have it in it to work this type of case anymore. There were some other incidents that were very difficult showing how this, this type of position was so unique and different. One case was I went out and got a report that a gravel mining company on the Mad River was in non-compliance and the biologist made it like it's a big deal, they're killing fish. I went out there and toured with the biologist and the biologist said, um, this big heavy equipment getting the gravel, big giant road grader, the guy comes out and goes, yeah, can I help you? And before I can even say anything, the NOAA biologist with his NOAA hat said, we're shutting you down right now. We're closing you down. You're killing fish. And, uh, you know, you're going to be arrested if you don't do this. And the guy's like ready to fight. He's like, you know, screw you. No. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. Time out, both of you. I said, sir, time out. I'm a federal agent. Okay. I'm an armed federal agent. I'm asking you just to stay by your equipment there. I'll talk to you in a second. Okay. We're not shutting you down. I told the biologist, shut your mouth. I swear to God, I'll put cuffs on you. I said, we don't have the power to shut down business and industry. That comes from a court order. I can't shut something down unless I actually see dead fish and there's no fish in the river at that time. There was no fish at the river at that time. So we had some radicalized, um, maybe their hearts were in the good place, but they were radicalized environmentalists and they just wanted to shut business down. And it was like, that's not how law enforcement operates. I said, you don't, you haven't even given me a take statement. You can't even show me dead fish. I said, if there's dead fish and I can see the equipment killing them, yeah, I can shut them down. Not permanently, but at least until we rectify the, the, the problem and do an investigation into the death of the fish. I said, you can't prove to me. Are you going to write me a take statement? Well, I don't need to write a take statement. Yeah, you do. Okay, we just can't shut business down and you're getting mouthy with this guy. You're starting a conflict and you're starting it. You're running your mouth and you don't have that authority. You don't have a badge and gun. I do. So you need to be quiet. And I talked to the guy. I took some video. We documented it. I said, look, this is your opportunity as a biologist. You're with me. You can do anything you want out here right now. Every inspection, you can go out there and snorkel. You can, and he's like, well, there's probably not going to be any fish. Then why do you want to, I want it. Why do you want to do this then? You know, he didn't like gravel operations. And I said, no, we don't do that. We have a difficulty at this time dealing with the biological side. And we're having numerous meetings, you know, with attorneys and, this is your responsibility. This is our responsibility. Uh, another incident where I had, and again, I discussed this in my ESA video, dealing with a farmer who's running a pump and he's dewatering a tributary to the Mad River, the North Fork Mad River, and he is causing a take. The stream's going down low when the pumps come on. So I spend you know, several weeks with cameras and getting up at, you know, four in the morning to be there when the pumps come on. This one, I use the non-traditional law enforcement method. That was one of the methods that we are taught to use for ESA habitat cases. Because I meet with the farmer, and he's a nice guy. He's like 70 years old. And he... I sit down with him, he gives me his whole life story about coming from the Azores with almost nothing, becoming a farmer, and and he's just trying, he doesn't want to kill fish, he just wants to water his alfalfa, and he's pumping out of the North Fork. So I come up with a plan. I'm not a biologist, but I do have a lot of background in environmental issues, and I said, because there's a why, so if you can imagine a why, the main stem bad comes like this, and the North Fork comes like this, and his pump is here, and I said, can you put your pump out in the middle of the Y, out in the gravel bar, dig a hole, put your pump down, and get that subsurface flow? He goes, I don't know if I can do that. I said, well, I, give it a try. 
you know, see if you, it's going to take a little extra energy to get that, because it's longer now, the flow and, and everything, but he does that. I spend another couple weeks documenting the difference between it being there at the North Fork and then in the middle. Being in the middle, it's having no effect on the North Fork. And so I correct the problem through this non-traditional law enforcement method of getting him to change his operations where he can still water his crops, but he's he's not killing endangered Chinook and Steelhead. The problem is the biologists were mad at me and Noah's civil attorneys were mad at me. So see, NOAA civil attorneys, they need cases. We had an actual ESA attorney. And this attorney needed cases to justify their position. So they're angry because I'm not bringing them a case package. The biologists are mad because I'm coming up. I had invited them out. And I said, what do you think? Can we do this? And they said, no, not without. Matter of fact, when I originally met with this guy, I said, have you tried to get an HCP, a Habitat Conservation Plan? And his response was, and I checked it out, and he was being honest, was he goes, they told me it would cost five or six thousand dollars and might take two years before I could get it. So in the meantime, I'd have several years where I couldn't water my crops, and I don't have that money. And it turned out he was right. That's what the biologist told him. HCPs cost money. They don't do it for free. So the attorneys and the biologists on this particular case with this farmer wanted to take the information that they had and run with a case. And I had to basically get with my boss. Unfortunately, he stood up for me. He said, no. Agent Dave did what he was trained to do. He got compliance with the Endangered Species Act through non-traditional law enforcement means. We've sent him to training numerous times to learn this method and he did that and you have to accept that he is the one in charge not you. I spent a lot of time on that case and it's a case that I'm extremely proud of even though it wasn't a prosecution it was a success. It showed to me that the federal government has the capability of working with private landowners to get compliance with the law. And it's funny when I tell other, at that time I would tell other agents, this is what I'm doing. I mean, I had agents that are now still with NOAA saying that's not law enforcement. You shouldn't be doing that kind of work. And it really was kind of hurtful because it was like, you know what? No, I'm not busting a big fish house, making a million dollar fine. I'm protecting endangered salmon and steelhead. And I'm allowing a farmer to continue. It's a little, nobody will ever hear about it. Nobody cares in the agency about a little tiny case. But in that little section of the world, the North Fork Mad River, something wonderful happened. We were able to protect endangered species and have farming occur jointly. And it was an investigation. I took a lot of time to prove before and after, like I said, day after day after day, being up there at four in the morning with cameras and measuring pools that were getting stranded when the pumps came on and proving, you know, once he moved the, 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 the pump, I didn't just say, okay, it's, it's fixed. I had to show the same amount of time that I proved that a violation was occurring to show that it wasn't throughout a summer. And, um, uh, I enjoyed doing that kind of work. It was, it, it was very different. You know, you're in the middle of nowhere. I remember one morning when the sun ro rise, I'm drinking coffee, trying to stay awake, sitting there and watching the pump come on. And right in front of me, a, a ringtail walked by. They, they're not real common in Humboldt. In California, they are. They're like a raccoon creature with a striped tail. But I'd never seen one before. And I was like, wow, this is cool. Another day I had river otters walk by and pine martins so it was very neat to see you know the the wildlife of that area and it's because i was out in the middle of nowhere and all kinds of crazy hours 
sitting there watching this go on. So I had that. I had the $6,000 case. We went on to, um, I had another case with the same timber company, Pacific Lumber Company. Somebody comes to me with an email where a registered professional forester and a biologist from the state are going back and forth. And finally, the RPF for Palco says, yeah, I falsified the information. I knew it was a wetland, but uh, I changed the to non-wetland so we could harvest $400,000, $500,000 in timber. Wow. And this information would be put into the HCP, so it made it kind of a federal document because it was part of the HCP aquatic um, plan. And so I started a criminal investigation because that's a 18 USC United States Code 1001 false statements. Here's a guy admitting in an email that he knew it was a wetland, but he chose to um, that he chose to falsify the, the timber harvest plan, the THP, to get it passed so that they could harvest all this it was second growth timber, which is still 80, 90 year old trees, very valuable timber. And so to start this out, I did notify the boss, this is what I'm doing, trying, I brought out a former RPF that was a biologist with NOAA, and a botanist, and an Army Corps of Engineers botanist. So I'm coming out there and I'm trying to get my homework together. What's going on out here? So the former RPF that's now a NOAA biologist, he does the calculations on tree stumps. So I'm helping him measure tree stumps out, the diameters to see, you know, okay, this size diameter would have been, you know, 100 foot tall, second growth redwood, um, to the what the value was. So we came up with between $450,000 to $500,000 in timber that was taken out of this, you know, 40 acre area that had been clear cut. And it was a wetland. You know, we're in hip waders going through these trees. It's, it looks like a, a swamp. Bringing in NOAA and Army Corps of Engineers uh, biologist, and I brought in a botanist from the California Department of Fish and Game. And they're taking soil samples and measuring them and aquatic plants. And they're saying, yes, this is wetland habitat, meaning that, you know, 80% of the year it's underwater. And it's been this way for at least 60, 70 years. So then I get the hammer dropped on me from my boss saying, you're upsetting people in high places right now. Your career is in danger. This is a good case. You want me to make cases as a special agent, but then you, once I start getting things rolling, and I'm like, yeah, this is a good case. You're saying, uh, 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 you're upsetting people. Noah had a timber liaison person that, and was relaying information to the timber company. This is what one of our agents is doing. And so all this is going on. Um, Diane Feinstein's office also called. What are you doing? Why are you harassing this you know, company, basically? They didn't say harass, but why are you? You've been investigating them for a lot of things. You know, they're just trying to do this, and they're, they're in compliance. And this was politics getting involved in this case. And so I took a big chance. Um, I told my boss, I, he said, you know, you're, I can't tell you not to do a case, but you're upsetting people. And I said, okay, I'm going to turn it over to the FBI. And then it'll be outside of the NOAA's responsibility. Wow. And that's what I did. I went to the FBI, I went to an FBI agent up here and said, this is what I've got. He says, I like this. This is interesting. He goes, the U.S. Attorney's Office usually kind of likes environmental cases. This is very different. I've never done anything like this before. I want to do this. So he goes, the case is mine. And the FBI can do that. The Federal Bureau of Investigation took my case. And the 
U.S. Attorney's Office said, yeah, I like this. This is interesting, unique, and different. Let's do it. So the ball's rolling on this. And it was interesting. The NOAA civil attorney for general counsel, sadly, was relaying information to the timber company about what was going on. And the FBI went to, I was told, I can't confirm this, but I was told by the FBI, they went to the no attorney and said, stop. This is not your case. You're not involved anymore. You're not allowed to discuss what's going on. And this created some ruffled feathers. And what happened was the FBI said, by the way, Noah, we want Dave to help us. Do you have an issue with that? And Noah said, he's all yours. And once the FBI took it, then it was like, I didn't hear anything anymore. Noah didn't want to mess with what the FBI was doing. We continued with the investigation. I mean, gigantic case package of evidence and emails. And we tried to interview the RPF. He had lawyered up. But with everything that we were able to put together, we went to the U.S. attorney and said, this is what we have. And the U.S. attorney dropped the ball and said, yeah, you've proven one person falsified a timber harvest plan that was part of a federal permit. And we really would like to see conspiracy that it can, involves upper echelons. And without that, we're really not interested. So then the case came back to me. And I gave the case to general counsel and said, here it is. And this is why the U.S. Attorney's Office, but I already had ticked off the NOAA general counsel attorney at this point because they've been warned. They were going to do nothing. And this is where, again, I'm like, you know, if this goes public, and there's a lot of people involved in this investigation from different agencies, and they're, they're talking about going public on this. They weren't, but I threw that out there anyway, just to kind of ruffle feathers. This is going to be ugly. And so what they did was they forced the timber company, they kind of gave them a warning, and they forced them through a three-day joint federal-state wetlands identification training course on what they can harvest and can't harvest in the different soils and aquatic life. And that area that they had harvested next to it, they were going to try to do another clear cut of a wetland. And that was protected. That was like, no, that's wetland. It's on Shively Road in Humboldt County. And that's been protected forever. So that was a really good criminal investigation working jointly with the FBI. And that was not considered a big case by the agency. Am I bitter about that? Because very few, very few NOAA agents do joint investigations with the FBI. Maybe some do, but very few. No, no more knowledge. I'll get one in a second. It's my wife. Wants another log for the fireplace. So, but at least it forced every worker from Palco, RPFs, everyone had to sit through this three-day course on wetlands identification. And I look at it and like, I did the best I could. Something came out of it. I saved some redwoods that should not have been cut. Those that were, even though it was criminal, that almost $500,000 in timber was harvested in violation of federal law, but the U.S. Attorney dropped the ball. They wanted a conspiracy. They didn't want to go after just one person. Hey, that's Northern California District, you know, San Francisco, U.S. Attorney's Office. Go complain to them. I did everything I could. But it's hard when you, you're you fighting the agency. Everyone is just pounding on you that you're doing something bad, but you're forcing them to do something. I forced this three-day course where every employee had to sit down for eight hours a day and learn about wetlands identification. And I protected, you know, maybe five or six acres of second-growth redwoods in a marsh that will never be cut again. But this is 45 minutes. I'm going to cut this short so it's not too long. I'll have 
other chapters of my time with NOAA National Marine Fishery Service, but this is an important thing for you to understand this. These kind of cases had never been worked on before and they'll never be worked on again. Uh, in Northern California, they don't have special agents. As of 2021, there's not a single special agent on the North Coast of California. Are these crimes still occurring? Yeah, I'm sure they are. But they were too complicated, too political, and the agency's heart wasn't into it. They're used to doing commercial fishing. That's where their bread and butter was. And here I'm doing something where I'm protecting wetlands where I couldn't even really prove whether salmon was using the wetlands or not, but it was a NOAA permit that protected class three water courses and class two water courses and class one water courses that allowed me to do this investigation into protecting wetlands that in some way did protect salmon and sealhead because the tributaries that would climb up into these wetland areas by clear cutting it, you were allowing a lot of sediment heading into the Eel River. But trying to explain that to somebody who's not on the West Coast, who doesn't understand habitat issues, they're like, why? There's no, you know, this is a waste of time. No, it wasn't a waste of time. Like I said, at the very least, I forced this timber company, they were put on notice, three different federal and state agencies saying these are the wetlands classifications picture shows and slideshows and talks and biologists talking to him for three days straight every employee this is what you can't do anymore and that's because of me I took a chance and I'm very grateful that the FBI agent out there I won't mention his full name Chris wherever you are right now took a chance to work on something that probably neither one of us would ever see again. Anyway, this is just part one. There's more to come. And thank you for listening. And if you're with Noah right now, everything I say is true. And if I offend you, eh, you'll get over it. Have a good night.